Thanks everyone for joining. So we have our great pleasure to have Professor Ender Konukoglu today with us from ETH Zurich. Uh, I, I won't make a very long introduction because I, I think many of you will know Ender. Uh, he's, a, he's a very close collaborator and friend working on medical image analysis for, for many, many years, decades, I would say. Okay. <laughs> uh, so so Ender, Ender has done his PhD back in France uh, with, with uh, Nicolas Oyash. Uh, at INRIA in Sofia Antipolis. He was a, a postdoc researcher at Microsoft Research. He was at the Martino Center doing uh, a postdoctoral um, uh, position over there. Uh, and, and he joined ETH. When, when did you join ETH? Three years ago? Uh, 2016. 2016, four years yeah. ago. Yes. So, so there he's, he's now leading a research team. And, and a lot of his work is very related and well aligned to, to topics you, you guys are interested in. And uh, I think today he's presenting some very exciting recent work on test time adaptation of neural networks. So we're really looking forward to this, Ender. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. I see lots of uh, familiar names. Um, so you sh guys should just ask questions. We don't have to do it formal whenever you want. Um, I might not be able to watch the chat or anything, but just to unmute and just ask. I think that would be better. I will also monitor the chat if, if anyone wants to type questions. Thank you. Um, okay, so the topic is test on adaptable uh, neural networks um, for robust medical image segmentation. And before that, let me give you a brief um, overview of how I see the world. Um, for biomedical image computing. And um, I think for Ben, this would be a repetition because since he can listen to this talk um, a few weeks ago, but I hope this will be new for other people. So we have the patient here, David. You um, don't have the slides yet. Ah, you don't have the slides yet? Ah, yeah. Okay, this would be interesting then. So let this work. Where's my Zoom now? Ah, ah, sorry. Robbie, I think you need to mute yourself. There's some background noise. Anyone, please mute yourself during the talk when you're not speaking. Uh, do you see the slides now? Yes, perfect. Okay. So, um, so David comes to the doctor, they order some tests and think it's a good idea to take the image, send them to a noisy, expensive machine, beautiful images comes out, radiologist reads the images, writes a report, and send them back to the doctor for further treatment planning and so on. And um, our goal has been for the last four something years is basically to automate this area here. And recently we're also trying to get our hands to this area. So hopefully create an automatic pipeline that kind of aids um, the entire patient care process. So some of the keywords that we actually think about in our daily lives are the ones that are given on the right hand side. So we talk quite a bit about reconstruction and outlier detection, um, segmentation, which is also part of this work and the lesion detection. And from the learning methods, we discuss quite a bit about semi-supervised learning, unsupervised learning. I have a particular interest in universe problems and using Bayesian methods to solve them and to integrate uncertainty quantification. And um, for those with a better pictorial memory, this is roughly what we try to do. So reconstruct images towards faster and less invasive imaging, um, try to create an outlier detector that can be universally used and um, do image segmentation in a way that is quite accurate and robust and able to tell you when things are not, um, or when things have multiple possible solutions. Um, this work uh, will actually be on robust learning methods. And if you have other questions on other works, just I mean, you can send me an email. I'd be very happy to answer. Um, before Dealing with anything, I should acknowledge people, uh, Nirav, Ertunj, and Krishna, who actually made this work possible, and the funding sources so that you know, people are happy uh, that they give us money. So the work has been accepted in medical image analysis now about a month ago, and um, you can find an extended version on archive, and I'm just going to keep that there, um, come back to it time after time if you're interested in to look at it. 
I will talk about the problem definition and I will do, I will go over what's currently available and I will try to adjust job to um, all possible avenues that are tackling the robustness. Then I will talk about what the test time adaptation is, um, provide some experiments results, ablation studies, and then conclude. And as I said, if you have questions in meanwhile, just unmute and ask, I think that will be much more enjoyable for me as well. So image segmentation, we basically know the problem. We want to predict pixel-wise class assignments given an image intensity. And currently the best way to do this is basically build a neural network. Um, you can actually get state-of-the-art state accuracies using one of the few architectures that actually work out of the box and train it with the images that you want. And they work for various anatomies, various modalities, and they get accuracies that are actually claimed to be roughly um, in the borderline of inter-rated variability for various structures. Um, so we tested this hypothesis whether actually they really do it for prostate imaging. And it looks like it's really the case. So we basically took 80 patient images and asked six readers to segment them manually. And the inter-rated dice agreement was 0.74, which is roughly similar to what we have um, in the prostate. Obviously, this dice score is with respect to only one rater, but you can imagine that this is actually somewhat close to what the raters agree upon. So looking at this, you can actually imagine the problem being completely solved. So there's not much really to do anymore, except that um, whenever we basically train these algorithms, underneath we assume that they will extend and generalize to images of the same anatomy but slightly with slightly different intensities so this can be you know just a little bit off or you know the same anatomy but with a completely different contrast same anatomy slightly different contrast or same anatomy with a different acquisition protocol and this network, which was trained on such images, which I will call the source domain later on, when we test them on these type of images with slightly different intensity characteristics, the segmentations fail. Here we have the ground truth images, and here we have the images that are the results of the segmentation algorithm. And we see that if the contrast differences are not huge, then the algorithm that was trained on the source domain images does something okay. So maybe this can be useful if you can kind of correct these mistakes up here. And when the domain is kind of very different, when intensity characteristics are very different, then we don't expect it to work at all. And this is not anatomy specific, this actually happens in all the anatomies. So effectively what we have is slight differences between the statistics of training and test data actually leads to degradation in performance. And this is not very surprising, I think, so far. Um, by now, everyone knows that convolutional neural networks are not really robust against domain shifts. Um, and usually people blame convolutional neural networks for this, but actually this applies to um, any machine learning algorithm. It's just like, we didn't, I think, test other machine learning algorithms so extensively to identify this problem before. So domain shift is brutal and it's common. And um, I will basically quantify the effect of it in this table. And I will populate this table as we go along in the talk. At the top row, what I have is the source domain data set. And I train an algorithm and I, when I test it on images coming from source domain, I get a dice score of 0.85 for brain, 0.84 for prostate and so on. And when I test it on target domains that actually differ in the intensity characteristic from the source domain, then I see the performance degradation. This happens in the brain, this happens in the prostate, this happens in the heart. And when the domain shift is larger, for example, the target domain one is T1 weighted image again, but with slightly different characteristics and target domain two for the brain is a T2 weighted image. So you can imagine that the intensity characteristics of T2 is much different than T1. Then the degradation is larger, not surprising. In the second row, what I show is the upper bound. So if I were to train an algorithm directly on the target domain and test on target domain, these are the dice scores I get. And notice that these size scores are roughly the same as what I got in the source domain. So you can imagine that there's nothing really off with these images, that they are segmentable with the neural network as well. So this difference here shows us that there's a big gap between um, networks applied on different domains. 
And this is very common in MRI. And you can imagine there are multiple things that are causing this. The very well-known field strength and magnet properties, and even the unknown or like less known of software updates and so on actually cause such differences in the intensity characteristics and lead to failure of the neural network. So um, Daniel and Ben published this article um, that actually named the different data set, data set shifts. And in this nomenclature, if you want, what we deal with is what's called the acquisition shift. So we assume that the anatomy, Z, is the same, but we have a different scanner resolution contrast modality or protocol that leads to a difference in the X, in the image that we observe. Okay. Now, the problem I hope I kind of uh, argued that the problem is important and it's actually a valid problem and it's still there and roughly it's unsolved. Um, and just because of that, there has been so much work on this. So I want to go a little bit over these works and I want to take it slow to basically really show you all the possible differences. And I, I, I will try to use a unified notation so we can actually compare things nicely. So let me provide this very simple notation first. Images are X, segmentations are Y, and a neural network is denoted by S, meaning segmentation, and the parameters of the network are the theta. So segmenting an image means that X is fed into the S theta function and I read the output. A source domain, Y will denote by subscript SD. So image source domain, label source domain, and I have N of them. And whenever I define the loss function over the source domain images, I will simply call it the source domain loss. So training a network on the source domain simply means that identify the parameters that use the lowest source domain loss. And predicting a new image simply means that I use the optimal parameters for the source domain and I apply it on the images. So target domain, I will denote by subscript TD. And I, again, I have the images and I have the labels. And I will assume that the images of the source domain are coming from a space of images, X sub HD. Target domain are coming from another space, and these spaces are exactly are not um, the same. So that's really the acquisition shift. On the other hand, the labels are coming from the same space. So it's the brain. I know what the brain anatomy should be. Um, this is actually not really related to the, um, the contrast that I use in the MR machine. So this uh, conditions here actually define the acquisition shift problem. The basic assumption is that even if I use the parameters that were optimized for the source domain, when I apply the network on the target domain, I will get a good segmentation. And this is what actually fails when there is a domain shift problem, as we've seen here. Now, from the machine learning perspective, there are actually multiple ways to tackle this problem. And the most robust and simplest way is basically you have um, a different training for each domain. You have a source domain, you have a target domain. I can actually have many samples in the source domain, many samples in the target domain. I simply minimize the losses on the source and the target domain. And there's no really, they don't have to be in the communication between these domains. And this will basically give you the upper bound on the target domain and the source domain. Obviously the drawback here is I need many samples in the target domain. So I cannot actually make an algorithm and ship it. I have to basically make an algorithm, ship it and ask the users to retrain the algorithm for me. Now to reduce um, the cost of this, of having many samples and having many labeled samples, I can actually use transfer learning, right? I can have few samples from each target domain. So then the problem of optimizing the algorithm at target domain becomes a fine tuning problem that I start the initial parameters from the optimized source domain. Now, this is also a little bit costly because I need these labels. The other idea is this unsupervised domain adaptation. Instead of actually um, asking for labels at the target domain, I can use images of the target domain and they come you know, less costly. I simply take my source domain images and the labels. I take my target domain images and I try to optimize at the target domain, basically optimize the loss of the source domain. So that's actually related to the segmentation loss. And then this invariant feature loss, right? that's what, um, Costas used saying that, you know what, I want to extract features that are the same whether you give an image from a source domain and an image from a target domain. Now, the issue here is I need a separate training at each target domain. 
So that's actually less costly, but I need to ship the source domain images, source domain labels. I have to get the target domain. I need a separate target domain training. And so I cannot actually ship an algorithm and say, hey, why don't you just use it? Now, one way to get um, over this is to say, uh, let me use domain generalization. So let me actually try to imitate this minimization at the source domain. Obviously, I will not have access to target domain images. I will only have images of the source domain, labels of the source domain. So I can actually try to minimize the segmentation loss of the source domain and some kind of invariant feature loss again. And I will talk a little bit further about what this can look like. At target domain, I don't need any more training. And that's the kind of the benefit of this. I can actually feed in the target domain image and get the segmentation. And assuming that these optimal parameters that were created in the source domain are both good for segmentation and also they kind of are robust to domain chains. Another alternative is domain generalization, but now this time with test time adaptation. So the source domain training remains the same. In the target domain, what you need is the same. You just need one image that will be segmented. But instead of applying directly the parameters, what you do is you update the parameters. And I will talk about how this adaptation can look like. Now, notably, there is actually one algorithm that people often um, ignore when they write these articles, which is the unsupervised segmentation, which actually kind of was solving this problem. So we have one image, source the target domain. We have no training in the source domain. And we basically try to optimize or maximize the joint distribution between an image and the label. So that's what, for example, the, that was the workhorse of, um, of, of neuroimaging for, for decades. So whenever you talk about SPM, FSL, free surfer, that's exactly what they use. And they're really robust algorithms and they work very, very well. So from the neuroimaging perspective, we're basically really trying to close the gap with the unsupervised segmentation algorithms. The downside is they're not really applicable to other anatomies just because they require registration, they require some assumptions about the number of tissue classes that you want and so on. So I argue that actually for medical image segmentation, domain generalization is the preferred setting because you can actually create an algorithm and ship it and they'll be able to use it directly for an image. They don't have to do retraining. They don't have to ship labels. They don't have to label uh, shipped images or um, data sets. They don't have to label images and so on. So I will focus on these two guys. And these are slightly different strategies. The first one is a training time strategy where the assumption is I gather all possible variations with my wonderful training. The other one is, says, maybe you don't. So let me actually add the inference time strategy to it. This is the adaptation. So first I will let me talk about these training strategies for domain generalization. This is a pictorial view of what I have. Um, so I basically talked about this in the notation slide. I have the image space here. And the image here is one sample of this guy. It gets segmented with the optimal source domain parameters, and I get a segmentation that looks like a prostate. So that actually lives in the label space. So it's actually very nice. Um, everything works, and everything is in their appropriate spaces. The target domain, I have another image space, not necessarily overlapping with the source domain image. And I basically have another sample from this space when I get an image like this. I apply the um, algorithm and I get a segmentation that's not really good, which basically means that it actually gives me a segmentation and that's a valid segmentation image. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just like, it's not in the space of plausible prostate segmentations. Now, the most obvious domain generalization training strategy is data augmentation. I basically take the setup and say, why don't I actually augment my source domain data set such that instead of just having this guy, I basically push the boundaries and have a larger source domain image space. And there has been quite a number of work in this regard, and you'd be surprised how effective it is. And I will basically give you numbers afterwards. And the idea is this heuristic augmentation assumes that the augmented source domain space will overlap with the target domain. So whenever I have an image that's in this area, for example, in the overlapping area, that my algorithm should work well in theory. And again, this actually provides a very strong baseline. Obviously, the performance improvement is limited to the augmentations and how the augmentations extends the source domain image. If you have 
have some ideas about the source term target domain. For example, if you have a single image or few images, you can actually create more clever augmentation technologies to make the overlap larger. Now, the second one is this meta-learning idea, so training strategy for the domain generalization. And there, the idea is I have multiple source domain images, and I want to make sure that my update steps, if I do an update with two of the domains, this update step should also increase or improve performance on the third source domain that was not used to compute the update step. So that update step is the meta-training step, and making sure that that update step actually improves the loss on both the two source domains that were used for meta uh, train step and the one that was not used is a real update step. And this meta learning has been shown in machine learning to improve what was proposed for domain generalization. It was later adapted and improved quite a bit. And the main idea is you assume that you have a larger source domain space that covers all of them. You try to create a strategy such that you gain some robustness. Now, all of these strategies are actually quite successful. So here I give you the results. So there are three meta-learning algorithms and a strong data augmentation algorithm. So first, let's observe. Surprisingly, I see that these algorithms, when applied on the source domain, they actually improve the source domain accuracy for the brain, for the prostate, and for the heart. So that's actually quite nice. So they, this robustness somehow acts as a regularization for the source domain training as well. They also improve quite a bit the accuracy of the target domains. In the brain, I go from you know, 58 to almost 70 or 75 in the augmentation case. And the same thing with the prostate and the same thing with the heart. So that's actually quite cool. And here I have two prostates because one of them assumes it's a whole gland segmentation. Some um, um, data sets are like this. And here I basically assume that the prostate is composed of two different domains, two different um, glands. So this is actually a more um, difficult problem if you want uh, for segmentation. And that's why the results are, um, the segmentation accuracy are lower. Um, what is interesting is, if the target domain is farther away from my source domain, then these algorithms actually does not really help. They do not really help close the domain gap. And that's expected. There is nothing really um, surprising about that. I could probably try to create very, very large augmentations such that this is included as well, but then I would need to know what augmentations to add to basically close a gap of such a large uh, domain gap. And uh, sorry for the interruption. Yes. Uh, just to be uh, clear to me, at least uh, perhaps to the others as well. So when you, in, this, uh, ex in these experiments, when you are performing the domain generalization experiments like with MLDG, the source domain, uh, so the domain generalization uh, have um, training, have multiple domains usually training, yes. and one test domain. So the test domain to me is clear, is either the TD1 or the TD2, depending. In the, in the training, which are the multiple yes. domains? So to be able to compare all these guys, we created these domains through large data augmentation. Okay, okay. So the, ah, okay. So one domain is, for example, augmentation with rotation. One domain is augmentation not rotation. With... These are basically with... so this um, Zhang. If you read the article, they show that um, contrast. There are specific contrast augmentations that really help. Yeah. So these are actually okay. constructed by these um, with type of augmentation. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thanks. Thanks. And then these guys, all of them are very much comparable. Okay, and thank you. I will you. talk at the very end about using the target domains as well and see um, that it's answered by domain adaptation idea and how well that compares. So the, the, the message is that all these DGs actually work quite well. They improve things. And what is surprising is data augmentation is, is particularly useful. But there's still a gap to close, especially the gap between the target domain that's actually far from the source domain. And this is kind of surprising because remember again, like this is a problem where the unsupervised um, um, image segmentation solves like really, really well. So we're kind of, I feel like the neural network in some sense um, is, a, is trying to catch up with what happened in neuroimaging in the last 20 years. For the prostate and the heart cases, obviously things are much different. But there's quite a bit thing to learn from 
though that literature. Okay, so I will talk about test and adaptive networks. And to be honest, this test and adaptation idea is really motivated by these unsupervised um, segmentation algorithms in terms of clustering algorithms. It evolved quite a bit, but the main motivation comes from there. So here we have the setup, okay? Um, the original setup that we had, we had the target domain image and the segmentation is off. So what we want is, we assume we will, our hypothesis is that actually I can update the segmentation network per each test image such that the segmentation gets better. So what I want is I want to update this guy such that the segmentation happens, actually moves within the plausible set of segmentations. And I think if you deal with segmentation, if you deal with plausible, if you think of, if you know about a little bit of Bayesian statistics, I think you probably already guessed what I'm going to um, in the entire algorithm. So, but I will just do it for the, um, for the others basically. So there are two questions. One of them is how do I drive the adaptation? And the second one is which parameters should I adapt? So first let's deal with how to drive the adaptation. I'll define a prior row over the segmentation space. And the reason why I define a prior row over there, it's because a naturally contrast agnostic space. If I'm imaging the same anatomy, I don't really care about the imaging statistics when I only talk about the anatomy. So I can actually use this space for any type of image you want. What I want is I want an adaptation strategy that will maximize the likelihood of the result. So make the result plausible. As I update the segmentation network, this point here will move within the plausible space of segmentations. How do I define this prior distribution? There are multiple ways. The way we did it was we used this helper network and that's a denoising water encoder that really takes into account the output of the segmentation network and spits out a denoised version of it. And well, this is really not enough. I actually need a cost function to derive the adaptation, right? The cost function then is given as the difference between the noisy segmentation and the output of the denoising water encoder, assuming that if my segmentation is actually good, meaning that it doesn't need any denoising, then the input of the denoising water encoder and its output will be very similar. So this distance will be meaningful. Now, the crucial point here is the denoising auto encoder itself is defined over the segmentation. And this is deliberate because, as I said, the segmentation space is contrast agnostic. I can simply use the source domain images, or rather the labels, to train the denoising auto encoder. And that directly applies to any target domain. The source domain um, and the target domain, while well, the labels are shared across all domains. And this differs a little bit um, from his concurrent work that, um, uh, that Jerry Prince uh, and his team proposed last Mikai, the self domain adaptive networks, where they said, why don't we actually use an autoencoder to do a sim very similar thing on the image space? And that's a very good idea. And they basically um, made sure things work using, to some extent, using some kind of regularization over the features extract and so on. But essentially, this approach well, it inherits the problems because whether I train a segmentation network or I train an autoencoder, that will just inherit the domain shift problems. I just take domain shift problems from the segmentation network and move it to the autoencoders. While on this case, if we actually define everything in the target domain, well, that's shared. So there is, there is no domain shift problem anymore. So then the next question is what do we adapt? And there are really three different options. The first one is I can adapt the entire parameter of the segmentation network. I can adapt a small subset of the parameters or I can append the shallow adaptation model and simply adapt that. And I can go through these options. The first one is it can really change too much because assume like these segmentations, they're, they're, they're really good in um, giving you what you want. So if I actually start changing the segmentation network completely, it will simply create a segmentation that makes the denoising vector encoder happy but the links with the images can be broken. On the other hand, adapting a small subset of parameters can really solve this issue because the, well, the, the segmentation really cannot change that much. But the problem is every time you talk about trained parameters, that basically means that you, you have some assets there. You, know, you invested quite a bit of 
time, you invested quite a bit of labeled examples, you invested uh, computation resources. So that I don't really want to play with those already optimized parameters, um, if not necessary. So this appending a shallow adaptation module and adapting only that module seems like a good compromise. It will keep um, an optimized network the same. So I will actually keep my investment untouched. And because it's a shallow adaptation module, I will ensure the dependency between the image and its segmentation is not broken too much. So the idea is really to put another network here that takes the image and applies some changes on it. And it's a restricted network that applies, can apply only very small changes. So effectively, it's kind of an intensity transformation. During the inference time, the idea is to keep the segmentation network fixed and simply update the parameters of this normalization module. And the minimization actually simply tries to minimize the loss of the denoising autoencoder. So the difference between its input and output. So I update the parameters of the normalization module if I, and then I simply, when I optimize it, I simply feed the image through it, get the normalized version, and then feed it through the segmentation. And during training, I optimize both N and S together. Now, some um, details. The denoising autoencoder actually is trained in 3D to capture the 3D information. And that ends up being super useful because all these objects are in 3D and actually being able to encode that information helps or increases the accuracy of this segmentation quite a bit of this denoising autoencoder quite a bit. The normalization module is, as I said, a shallow adaptation module. It's a residual network that's composed of very few number of layers. So we tried with three or four layers of three by three convolutions with our BF type nonlinearity. So the changes that you can use on the image are very limited. So that's the method. Now I will talk a little bit about the um, experimental results. So just out of the box, this is what the results look like. So at the very, um, so these are the results that I showed before. I added another module here from I think Enzo's um, lab that actually used the nosing autoencoder as a post-processing step. And we see a similar trend. So it improves the domain gap when the um, segmentation or the domain was not very different and it um, has difficult time when the domain is very different. And these two rows, is what we propose. So the first one is basically, you know, I do the adaptation for each test image separately. And the second one is, is a faster version of this, which basically means that if I have multiple test, time, test images uh, from the target domain, I optimize for the first one and then initialize the optimization for the other ones with the parameters of the first one. So that's the only difference. So it's fast in terms of in the top one, I have to, I do, let's say 500 iterations in the bottom one, I can get away with 50 iterations. <laughs> and the results are shown as the ones that are here. So as you can see, um, it actually does quite well, um, very similarly on most of the cases with the target domains, I would say it's slightly better. And when the target domain is very different, it actually does quite well as well. It gives you a dice score that's quite high. Um, in the end, segmentation is almost useful. And I say almost because actually it's not exactly useful because there's still a big gap between this guy and the benchmark. And this is still very different than what neuroimaging tools um, that people tend to avoid these days can achieve. But we're Hi. getting there. Sorry to interrupt, Ender. I just had a quick question. Um, does the baseline model for the source domain also use the normalization network? So N phi, is that, I like you mentioned that it's trained with the source uh, domain. In these cases, yes. So the proposed method uses the, I mean, the baseline here given here, the source domain, it doesn't use any, it's a normal training. Okay. Uh, we only use it um, in the proposed method. I see. So this, so, in the baseline, you basically do a normal normalization, you know, 98th and second percentiles are mapped to zero, 01 or, or mean and standard deviation normalization. Okay, I guess I was just curious in that case whether um, N5 made an impact on the source domain. Um, no. Okay. No. Uh, it actually am... adds like another network, so it doesn't really change much. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Ender. Since we're, we're doing questions, I, I have a question about, about the method. 
So how do you, maybe I missed it, how do you obtain the denoise segmentation at best time? Um, I feed it through the uh, denoise input encoder. So at test time, this is what you have on the right hand side. Is the denoise autoencoder also trained during training time or just at test time? No, Maybe no, it's the, the denoise input encoder is trained during training time at the source domain. And then you ship it at the target ah, domain okay. as well. In the target domain, it's direct at flight, so there is no training there. Okay, thank you. So to follow up on this, so doesn't this depend on the assumption that the Dinozic autoencoder has modeled the type of failures that you can observe from the possible domain shifts. Yes. Okay. So basically, in other okay, okay. And so you... um, you'd be surprised how well it actually performs with simple things. So in this case, we basically you know um, take um, patches of a random size and random number and simply um, shuffle the labels. Okay. and train the denoising auto encoder like that. Uh, we also tried actually using um, segmentations that were outputted uh, for a not completely trained network. And the, the gains there were marginal. So we opted for this simpler version that's actually simpler to explain. Yeah. So you just, you just shuffle labels for a random size, for randomly chosen patches, right? Yes, random okay. size, that's random good. number, and okay. trained like that. Good, good to know it works, thanks. And I also have a follow-on question about yeah. this denoising autoencoder. Yes. So does it require any kind of uh, spatial normalization? Uh, no. So we didn't do any normalization. So we assume that the field of views are similar, but even then you don't have to assume really that too. Um, in these cases, we basically, you know, reoriented the images based on the header information in the DICO but there was no additional affine or non-rigid or any type of transformation. Thank you. So that, right, that's, a, that's a little bit different than the atlas-based segmentation mm -hmm. um, where you would need to do registration. Okay. Um, so visually what it looks like, uh, on the left-hand side, we have the images and the ground truth segmentations. Um, the second, column here is basically what happens when we only use the source domain. So here the normalization happens, um, you know, with respect to the zero one normalization. So, and the results are not very good. If I actually train the source domain images with lots of augmentation and, you know, change the normalization with respect to the augmentations that are there as well, then I get actually much, much better results. So this data augmentation from Zhang et al actually works surprisingly well. And when you add um, test time adaptation to it, then you actually, you know, you know go another notch. Uh, you can actually see in the T2 weighted image, things are a bit different, quite different. So you actually get a reasonable segmentation if you compare with the ground truth here. The same thing with the prostate images as well. Now, what is surprising and nice uh, with the method here is, well, not surprising, but what is, what is um, maybe the essential point of the method here is, you see that both of these domains are actually converted into similar looking images. So it converts a T2 weighted image into something that looks like um, T1 weighted. Obviously it's not the T1 weighted image, it's the normalized version of it, but it basically converts the, um, the intensities and that happens at test time. Now, once this was done, we basically did quite a bit of ablation studies and I will um, um, talk about three of them here. The first one was, um, we said, why don't we actually, uh, so my hypothesis was that Changing the parameters of the entire segmentation network can really be problematic because segmentation network can break the link between the image and the segmentation. Right? It can actually create a, a segmentation that only makes denoising autoencoder happy. And this seems to be the case. If I adapt both the segmentation network and the normalization as well, and we basically did the ablation studies with this setup so that it's directly comparable with the proposed method, we see that the segmentation accuracies drop. Uh, what is surprising is in the second target domain, you still get a reasonable number. So it's still powerful, but overall the, the accuracies for all the other ones drop quite a bit. The second one was um, we wanted to find the upper bound of the strategy of doing adaptations. So instead of using a denoising autoencoder, we simply use the ground truth table to derive the adaptation. So you really want to change the parameters of normalization module 
to minimize the loss between the segmentation network prediction and the ground truth labels. And these are the upper values, these are the values. So this the second row in the ablation state. Now, there are two things. One of them is these values are higher than what we get with the domain adaptation, which basically tells us that there is a gap between the current method using denoising or tenko to derive the adaptation and the ground truth. And the second observation is these numbers are lower than the benchmark of the target domain, which basically means that this normalization strategy is also limited. Now that might be due to two things. Either the normalization model is limited. So if I use a larger or a better one, if I put more effort in it, I can get better results. Or just the imaging is slightly different. So you don't actually recover the extra information by using normalization. And the last part was, well, since we have this, um, we can also just apply the denoising autoencoder as a post-processing step instead of just deriving a minimization. Right? That would be the same thing as applying an MRF loss at the end. And these are the two guys here. Now that's actually a good idea, but the issue is the moment I actually leave out the segmentation network and leave out normalization, then the post-processing step will create a segmentation that makes the denoising autoencoder happy. But again, it can actually break the link between the segmentation and the image. And that's kind of what we observe as well. If I do 10 passes of denoising autoencoder, I reduce the errors in the segmentation. So the values here are actually nice and get getting high. But if I do 100 passes, then the link is broken and the, 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 the segmentation accuracy starts decreasing. So actually, without any adaptation, applying a post-processing step um, can actually reduce some value, reduce some errors and make things better, but it has a limit. The next study we wanted to do was whether the algorithm we propose is stable. I mean, I can create an algorithm, but if I early stop it at some point, um, then actually it's not very useful. So we took the brain images and we took the prostate images and we basically ran the number of iterations multiple times. So in the results that I showed actually, we do early stopping and the stopping criteria is if the denoising auto encoders input and output are close enough, meaning that the loss is no longer minimized by adapting the normalization model, we simply stop the uh, iterations. But we can actually go on, there is no difference. And what we see here is it starts in the first hundred or thousand iterations quite nicely. The dice scores between the prediction and the ground truth increases. And then it reaches the maximum and then it stays there, slightly decreasing for the brain and basically staying stable for the prostate images. So that's actually quite nice. The algorithm seems to have a stable adaptation process. Another way to look at it would be actually look at the trajectories of the segment of the dice scores, both with respect to the input and the output of the denoising autoencoder. So that's actually what we minimize during adaptation and the dice score between the prediction and the ground truth. So each of these lines are actually a sample. So this, for example, orange line is where this guy starts from and during the adaptation, the dice scores increase. And the nice thing is, as you can see, both the y-axis and the x-axis, they both increase, meaning that I increase the noising autoencode as I score. That's actually what I want to do. But this also increases the real dice score, both for the brain and for the prostate. Now, what do they look like in the evolution, in the, in the, in the visually? This is one. For the prostate, so I have the image and the ground truth segmentation. At the very first step, my predictions are not very good. And then I basically go through the adaptation process and I'm showing segmentation results at different iterations of the adaptation. And I see at the end that I have actually a prostate segmentation that looks like a prostate segmentation and that's actually quite close to what the image shows. Obviously, there is a big difference between the ground truth and this. Well, smaller difference, but still a big difference between them. And that's probably, um, limitation of the algorithm as well as the discrepancy or the integrator variability in the segmentation problem. Uh, when I look at the dice scores at the bottom, I show the dice score of the denoising autoencoder's input and the output. And that's what we're trying to increase and that increases nicely and it reaches unreasonably high values. Now the real dice score also increases, but it's kind of limited at the lower value. For the brain, things work better so again, this is the image, this is the ground truth, 
my initial prediction at time point zero. And this is the, at the end of the adaptation process. Again, the denoising autonomic coders dice scores is increasing, and that's what we were trying to increase during the adaptation. And the real dice kind of follows that um, in a graceful manner. Now, comparing this with the post processing um, or using denoising autonomic coder post processing gives a little bit more insight. So, um, if I apply the denoising autonomic coder post processing in the brain images, I see that the dice scores, and this is the result of the source domain training with data augmentation, and I apply denoising auto encoder to this after one pass, 10 passes, 100 passes, I see that the segmentation quality actually decreases. And this is probably because the segmentation is quite complicated having multiple structures. As opposed to this, it has some adaptation because it actually links the segmentation to the image, achieves a better dice score. For the prostate, things are a bit better. Probably the segmentation problem is easier or probably the structure is easier. Like the denoising autoencoder helps, but again, it doesn't reach the test time adaptation performance. The last uh, reviewer actually in, um, kind of pushed us to compare the method to unsupervised domain adaptation. At the beginning, we said that you know the target domain, we don't really have access to it, so we shouldn't do it, but um, they insisted, and I'm glad that they insisted. So we did the tests and compared with the unsupervised domain adaptation. And we did with uh, trained with the Costas method, and we also uh, compared the cycle again that was published, uh, I think either a middle or a Mikai. Um, so what we did was we basically, you know, took the source domain images and the target domain images. Um, these TD target domain TR1 means that I basically took 20 or 25 um, target domain image for the training. And this TS means I took fewer target domain images. I think it's only the test image that was taken for the unsupervised domain adaptation. Now I give results for the unsupervised domain adaptation um, from the invariant feature method only for these cases where the target domains are closed and not the case where the target domain is far away because in the original paper that's what it was proposed for and we couldn't really make it work for this case so I basically don't give results for that. And the same thing for the cycle again. We couldn't make the cycle again work for small domain differences, but it worked quite well for large domain differences. Now, um, you can see that both methods work. They actually can close the domain gap if you have access to target domain and if you want to do retraining in the target domain. But what is surprising is this approach to test time adaptation that does not use the target domain images during training and that does not need retraining at target domain achieves quite similar results for all the cases. So that's actually quite nice. So um, despite not using source domain for the adaptation, the test and adaptation performs similarly. And I'm going to argue that this is actually a linear method that yields similar performance. And then can I yes. ask, I find this super interesting actually because I thought I would see exactly the opposite here. Uh, so that I was under the impression that UDA tends to work a little to be useful when the domain gap is big and not so useful when the domain gap is small and you yeah. found out the opposite, right? I mean, um, we can actually talk more and we can basically involve, uh, yeah. involve but um, we've tried really so many different things to basically make it work. Okay. And, um, okay. I'm just trying to say that I understood correctly what you found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, okay. that was, uh, maybe, maybe we can actually link with Nerv as well, but we couldn't make it work for the T1 yeah. domain shift. Okay. And likewise, the cycle GAN just didn't work for small domain shifts. It just, yeah. it just changed the images completely. And I, yeah. Um, no, it's interesting. It's opposite of what I would, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. So some small conclusions. So domain shift is a limiting factor and we all know this um, and test time adaptation can mitigate the problem at least for segmentation and to some extent. It's exciting because there's still a gap to close so it's not closed yet. And um, comparison with the UDA shows that actually you don't maybe need access to the source domain for retraining at each target domain. Maybe actually you can really solve this problem by getting inspiration from um, neuro imaging and unsupervised segmentation. Um, approaches. And obviously, I don't really have to tell you, but this is quite an exciting problem that's very much linked with the bigger issue of, of generalization in neural networks. Um, and this is supposed to be an easier generalization problem. And with that, um, I should thank Nirav again, acknowledge him. And if you have any further questions, I'm more than happy to answer.
Thank you very much, and uh, I have a clap for everyone. This is beautiful, and I, I'm glad we recorded this because I think it's such an excellent reference for many people working in this field. So we should definitely think about making this available uh, widely. There's a question from Miguel. Miguel, do you want to ask that yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. So going back to my, uh, my previous question, I was wondering, uh, during training, mm -hmm. Do you introduce any perturbations to the input of the denoising autoencoder uh, to make it noisy enough to make sure it trains? So perturbations, I don't know what it means. We basically needed to um, synthesize noisy segmentation. So, and, and as I said, so it basically you take the segmentation, you take random number of random size patches and simply shuffle the segmentations and ask the noise autoencoder to um, reshuffle them. And uh, was that all the perturbations you've tried or did you try with different? Uh, so we, we, we thought that we can be clever and basically have a training strategy where basically we start training a neural network, the segmentation network, and take the initial results that actually the algorithm spit out in the initial iterations. And the, the gains were marginal. And mm -hmm. it's a much more complicated algorithm to explain. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Cost of the other question. Hi, and there one one question again. I, I always try to draw learnings, especially for the when you reproduce a lot of uh, other methods. I find very interesting. So if I take you to the slide with the with the results, with the table with the results, uh, I wanted to ask you. So your NML DG and the MASF. Uh, with um, data augmentation, I want to ask: Are the data augmentations yeah. so the no the one that has MLDG on it? Yes, excellent, excellent. So the MLDG and the MESF, the different domains for training, right? Mm -hmm. Are the different data augmentations? And I want to ask: Are these data augmentations the same as the ones that you have for the strong baseline, that is source domain plus data augmentation? And if yes. they are, okay, so they are. Yes. So what does it mean that the simple baseline that just training with these data augmentations is actually in almost all cases better than the um, MLDG, MASF that are using these domain augmentations? So it's basically so yes, the simpler works better. I mean, in this case, yes. Okay. okay. And if you have additional source domains, maybe yeah. things will be different. That yeah. I don't know. Okay. But for the contrast change problems, that seems to be the case. Okay. And I so know this is not um, what you guys found in the NIPS paper, but um, yeah. Well, different settings, different, uh, of course, different the settings, settings, is quite different. different yeah. The results, I uh, understand that's why I'm asking to learn. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm Miguel, go ahead. Uh, no, I think Giacomo had one. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, real quick. Thank you very much. Extremely interesting talk, Ender. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if there's a way to use a strategy like this to other types of domain shifts, uh, like different, um, say, data distributions uh, regarding pathology. So I guess that if you train on a data set that doesn't have a given uh, um, like label set for a pathology, it will not really be able to translate to one that has. But what about cases in which you have different uh, uh, numbers uh, of images with a given uh, um, issue uh, that uh, you then want to try and test uh, on a data set that has a lot of that specific pathology? I don't know if this uh, makes sense. Uh, so I don't think I understood the second part of your question. Well, uh, I was thinking for the way you train your denoising autoencoder, and maybe you start on a data set that has just a very small prevalence of a given uh, label for a pathology. Mm -hmm. And then you want to test uh, your model in a data set in which that label is instead prevalent. Oh, yeah. uh, do you have any insight on how this would work there? No. Okay. I don't. Uh, yeah. Sorry. No. Um, we wanted to do, so we're trying to get some images from radiation oncology with metastases, brain metastases. And uh, the idea is try it a little bit there, but I don't have any intuition how it will work. And um, yeah, as I said, I think um, you have to consider this type of method similar to the probabilistic image segmentation of neuroimaging. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Miguel, you had a question? 
Yeah. So uh, your method sort of relies on the the base network giving you something to start with for the denoising autoencoder, and uh, so mm -hmm. um, and for anatomy, I think that that's always going to work to some extent because there's there's sort of like a as you say a prior over mm -hmm. what what an anatomy looks like. So I guess you talked about metastasis. Have you tried this on lesions where uh, that prior is is less uh, obvious to what it is? Yeah, I'm not yet, as I said. So um, I can give you an answer maybe in mm -hmm. a few months, but I don't have an answer now. OK, thank you. Yeah. But to be honest, I think um, if I understand something from neuroimaging, the main idea is that like, you always have this um, strong baselines of unsupervised learning, uh, unsupervised detection that's added to those methods. And that works surprisingly well if you integrate multiple atlases and multiple proper images and a good kind of rough ideas about the lesion. Um, yeah, I mean, when we were doing outlier detection work, um, again, that there's n number of neural networks out there for it. And I think it's only it was in the last year or so we were able to pass the pre-deep learning methods for neuroimaging. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, can I ask you a question related to the prior that you that you have on your label maps? What's your feeling? How important is it that every label is actually represented in the input image? So, so what I'm what I'm thinking of is you might have domain shifts to mo modalities or sequences. Let's say. T1 is your source, Flare is your target, where you have structures that are not visible in the other domain, like they don't have any contrast. What happens in that case? Um, that's a very good question, and I don't think the algorithm would do very well. I mean, um, or I think it will then struggle between breaking the link between the image and the segmentation. And uh, I wouldn't trust it in that setting. So I wouldn't segment a CT image with a network that was trained by MR. But um, that's also for me a much harder problem. So I'm much more comfortable with this setting where I'm trying to um, segment different MR images that I know have the same anatomy and have similar contrast. Because you, you, you mentioned initially the assumptions you make and you said the label space doesn't yes. change. I guess one could argue that there are acquisition shifts where implicitly the label space changes because things might be visible or not visible. Yes. So the, the strong assumption is that the label space doesn't change. Uh, again, um, yeah. The, the original paper of CycleGAN was, again, for C2 to MR and MR to C2. And those methods are always a little bit... Um, Kind of, yeah, I, I constantly scratch my head whenever I review them and I happen to review all of them somehow. Um, like, I mean, you generate information there. Excellent. We are, we are right on time. Um, I'm sure if there are other questions, Ender is happy to answer them by yeah. email or even Nerav, I think is probably very happy to be contacted as Absolutely. well directly. Uh, you, you show this email, we can share it later. Thanks again, uh, and for taking the time and, and doing this fantastic talk. Thank Once you very more. much. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for listening. Excellent. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you for joining. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for the talk.